Welcome everybody uh, to SciArc's lecture series. I'm Mimi Zeiger, a critic and curator and also visiting faculty member at SciArc. So here we are, uh, it's a Wednesday night, the day after the election, after a four year long election season that has built and built and built until we have wanted to crack, scream, break down or collapse. We are at all kinds of uncertain right now, and we're in the third wave of pandemic that has devastated many and is pushing all of us to the brink. So here we are uh, gathering together virtually to listen to Jack Halberstam speak on dereliction, a condition of ruination, of neglect, of architecture and systems falling apart. It's a title and a lecture that may confirm the shaky foundations of our current collective psyche uh, and our current collective condition. And yet it is here in the cracks and the rubble that we might also find a glimmer of hope. I'm so honored to introduce Jack, who is a shaper of queer studies and really instrumental in the opening up of arenas centered on the gay male experience to include issues of trans identity, feminism, race, and class with attendant overlaps and slippages in between. He's a professor of gender studies and English at Columbia University and author of numerous books of essay and essays, including Wild Things, the Disorder of Desire, which was just published last month. Jack is a self-proclaimed low theorist uh, with writings that are just as likely to cover postmodern geographers or Frankfurt School critical theorists as punk rock or Lady Gaga. And I'm often drawn to his writings on temporality, such as in the book In a Queer Time and Place, and the possibility of alternative, non-normative, non-binary futures, utopias even, that exist just beyond our event horizon. So, while that book charts out spatial relationships, both urban and rural, Jack's interest in architecture as a site of analysis takes hold in his essay, Unbuilding Gender, Trans and Architectures in and Beyond the Work of Gordon Matta Clark, written for Places Journal, who awarded him the Arcus Places Prize in 2018 for innovative public scholarship on the relationship between gender sexuality and the built environment. This incredible rereading of Matta Clark's work posits that the artist's slicing and carving of buildings in 1970s New York City offers a legacy or model for trans artists, trans people in its creative destruction, a non-binary state of neither being ruined nor functional architecture. So this introduction, given where it lands in our current cosmic timeline, seems to require a bit of catharsis. So I'll finish with a short paragraph taken from Jack's 2019 Off Manifesto, which was written in his words to, quote, be performed at a high octane, loud and punctuated with the smashing of old iPhones and PDAs. I will skip the smashing on my end, but tonight feels like it might be important for you to do so on your side of the Zoom screen. So let me quote, insist, insist, insist. There is no such thing as repetition, no such thing, she said, only insistence. We insist, turn it up, turn it up, pump up the volume, pump up the jam, make my day, make my day, he said before he shot off. He's always shooting off, stop shooting off, he shot off. They were killed off, they are always killed off. We insist, we insist that you break it off, break it off, stop off, it's off the hook, off the cuff. Ah, scream off, words off, sense off, lights off, rhythm off, make off, made off, make it off, make it off, end quote. Jack's language resonates with the onslaught of media streams of contemporary culture, like the turning of a radio dial across frequencies while driving fast down a dark highway and catching just enough fragments to piece together meaning 
before phrases dissipate into the night. The world's words are rhythmic, like protest chants, visceral and instruction and instructive. So uh, let me close here uh, with this voice of resistance, of insistence cutting through the static um, and say that it's my great privilege to welcome Jack Halberstam to SciArc tonight. Thank you so much. Oh, wow. Thank you, Mimi. That was uh, an absolutely beautiful introduction. Uh, I'm just thrilled. Um, I'm excited to be here with you all. I know this is a weird time, and I hope that my uh, talk will reflect exactly how weird it is. Um, I'm just going to get ready to share my screen here. And there we go. Okay, so yes, this is a really weird time. I was thinking um, yesterday as I was preparing for the talk, did I consider the fact that it was the day after an election when I uh, either agreed to do the talk this day or suggested this day for the talk? Anyway, I know that we're all uh, thinking about both the outcome of this election, what this election means, what it means that so many people, uh, you know, despite everything, voted for Trump, uh, no matter what the outcome. And I know that we're all puzzling through this. As we do, I want to offer a reflection on the bankruptcy of the moment that we're in by pushing us back to the 1970s to a very, very different temporal frame, to a different political moment. On behalf, why do I want to do this? On behalf of producing a new vocabulary for transformative change in an era of stalemate, compromise, and environmental decline. And while the talk is absolutely, as promised, going to be on destitution uh, and dispossession and other things, the title of my talk tonight is Nothing, because I'm actually going to try to convince you that nothing is what we need to do. And there it is again. So in this era and on the other side of a tense and strange election. I hope that you agree with me that this is a moment for trying to develop new angles on power change. And what I'm going to explore in this talk, developing my work on Gordon Matter Clark, um, the exercise of world unmaking. And some of my thoughts about destitution and world unmaking are in sync with a recent manifesto by the anonymous group, the Invisible Committee out of France, who in a new manifesto came out maybe two years ago called Now, they have a whole chapter um, uh, on destitution and they argue in that chapter that it is only from the destituent Point, standpoint that one can grasp all that is incredibly constructive in the breakage. So we're going to dig into this idea of breaking and wrecking, unbuilding and unmaking to see what it is that we can um, gain from thinking in those terms. Now, um, the truth is that um, earlier moments in queer studies were deeply invested in utopian projects of what we then called uh, world making. Um, and I want to break actually from that tradition in order to investigate what I will call an an architectural strategy um, of how we should unmake this world, this world that we currently inhabit. Um, what is this world that we currently inhabit? It's a world lousy with human uh, animal viral transmission that has been caused by humans trespassing on um, animal habitats. It's a, a moment that is, you know, uh, full of global capital accumulation and forms of domination that have returned as authoritarian leadership. It's a time of real estate domination and predatory lending. Pick your poison, really, in terms of this uh, real estate uh, domination. And in this mode of domination, people become convinced that freedom will be theirs through property. And then, ironically, go into debt bondage to realize a, 
a dream that turns out to be a nightmare. Um, in terms of uh, queer wars, we can see the way in which white queer communities get folded into these modes of governance through family structures, real estate investment, and through the promise of security. Um, and then this, in turn, reduces the possibility of queer oppositionality at a moment of extreme peril. So you can see that there are, there are so many reasons to think about unmaking the world and very few reasons to continue with this propulsive forward momentum where we keep just doing it, you know, to quote Nike, we keep doing, we keep owning, we keep investing. Um, instead, I want to um, back away from the idea of a built utopia and explore an experiment with the idea of not just unbuilding, as I've been saying, but not owning, draining value out of sites of possession, and then clearly inflecting these strategies by thinking about them alongside the experimentations that happened under the heading of an architecture in the 1970s. So what would we oppose ownership to? Dispossession, I'll argue. How would we replace the notion of development through demolition? Uh, what would replace profit? Nothing. Um, and we can also we can go on and on with that chain of associations, look into the way in which intimacy industries today have replaced cruising and so on, and think about how to bring back some of the erotic energy of cruising. Um, in this talk, I'll try to get to some feminist fantasies of anarchist rebellion that are less focused on, on simply on cruising, more interested in violence. Um, and throughout the talk, I want to develop an offer for you, a politics of nothing. I will advocate for nothing. I will offer nothing. I will speak of nothing. And I will ask you to embrace nothing with me on behalf of what you will see is an empty handed future. So to proceed, let me, as is my want, move through a series of examples that I hope will unpack for you both the politics of nothing, the uh, activities that gather under the heading of dereliction, and the politics that can be um, uh, perceived through the idea of dispossession. Just because of the season, um, and that's just a, a hint of what is to come in terms of looking at the collapsing architectures of the peers in New York City in the 1970s, where Gordon Matter Clark carried out his uh, wondrous cuts into the crumbling peers, and where um, Alvin Baltrop took pictures of cruising young men against uh, the, the framing of these buildings as they came down. But I want to start just to be very topical for the moment with what I think is a, an anarchitectural uh, performance um, that was went under the heading of campaign. And I just thought this would be appropriate for tonight and would dig into why we might want to back away from this earlier moment of queer world building um, and dig into the concept of nothing. And I'm hoping that this first example will make clear the politics of doing so. So in 1992 and 1996, a black uh, uh, drag queen from San Francisco, uh, Joan Jett Black, ran for president and her whole project was called Camp Pain. This was, you know, how she understood her run for the presidency. Um, she ran in 1992 under the slogan of Lick Bush in 1992. And then it, her, she cast Clinton and Bush at that time as two sides of the same coin to which she claimed she offered an alternative. Um, she even slipped into the Democratic National Convention uh, in 92 in boy drag and then went into the bathroom, changed into drag queen mode and announced her candidacy on the national stage before being dragged off. It's an amazing uh, spectacle. She wouldn't be able to do it today, no doubt. But uh, eventually, you know, she did not win in 1992 uh, update. Uh, but in 1996, she ran again. This time, she self-styled herself as the only representative of the Black Pantsuit Party, and she chose a militant dyke as her running mate, and together they promised that if elected, they would rename the White House as the Lavender House and fire the whole government. If that doesn't appeal to you right now, I really don't know, you know how to go on. Uh, I find that whole concept to be amazing as while well, looking at CNN. Um, 
But what was the campaign? What was the campaign that Joan Jett Black ran? Joan Jett Black ran by appealing to people who do not vote in national elections. And she claimed that people who did not vote, who in other words did nothing, were in effect voting for her. And she was the candidate for the non-voters. Um, so she then went to the Iowa primary in 1996, declared her candidacy for all non-voters. And think about who non-voters are. Non-voters are people who have been disqualified, disenfranchised, who have not been spoken to or spoken for, who understand that the choice they're being offered is no choice at all. And that, in this country, in many elections, is over 50% of the potential electorate. So by running on behalf of those people, Jet Black actually identified a real constituency in this country. In the Iowa primary of 1996, she garnered over 440,000 non-votes. And using this tactic, she declared a victory. Okay, so I just want you to think about that as we are here in the middle of this hotly contested election already beset by multiple lawsuits and coming down to these states where apparently people can't make the choice between you know a psychopath and someone else. Um, think about the radicality of a black drag queen running for office on behalf of people who simply don't think that politics in the way that it's conducted in mainstream uh, electoral debate has anything at all to do with them. So what is this? This is a potent example of not doing, of paying attention to votes not cast, voters disabled, the large proportion of the population who are disenchanted, excluded, and disenfranchised. Those voters, by the way, are not apathetic or stupid. They recognize instead that in being given a choice between two very conservative, often white, old men, they are begin being given no choice at all. And it is this kind of activity and a, a kind of aesthetic, performative activity on the part of genderqueer anarchists that forms a building block in this perverse orientation to the political that I want to develop today under the heading of nothing. So let's pluralize our nothing. Let's dig into nothing and think about nothings, a wide range of nothings that I'm going to share with you today um, on behalf of this, I hope, you know, reasonably attractive alternative vocabulary of dismantling, unmaking, undoing, unbeing, not doing, uh, unacting, and so on. I want to start, though, with this uh, image by African-American photographer of the New York City piers. These are the, you all know, I'm sure, the piers on the west side of New York City that back in the 60s and 70s were the site of a large shipping industry that then fell into disrepair um, in the post-industrial era. And uh, after the collapse of part of the West Side Highway um, that made the, the waterfront sort of inaccessible, they became home to... Uh, homeless people, um, drug users, um, uh, uh, young cr people, lots of gay men who are cruising, and hundreds of artists. But I begin with this picture by Alvin P Baltrop, an unusual picture for him uh, in a way, um, because it sort of tells a story and many of, many of his um, photographs are sort of non-narrative, as you'll see. But because also I think it captures a kind of conventional patriarchal way of looking that his photographs push back on and that we're going to step away from. What, why do I say that it's patriarchal? Well, look above the um, conventionally masculine man uh, spraying a brick wall under the sign of a, a dripping uh, phallus. Um, he sets up as an artist, spray painting or in some way leaving his mark, pulling together the strands of ruins, of the ruins within which he finds himself in order to try to make something out of their unraveling. And my argument today is that we actually need to leave ruins as ruins, stop trying to make them into something and leave them as nothing. What we're going to do is sort of disappear, if you like, through that hole that has opened up in the middle of the photograph, a frame within a frame, framing what? Nothing, space emptied of humans, um, open, 
uh, to light, teeming with what Jane Bennett calls the vibrant matter of non-human uh, activity. It's empty space framed by collapse. Uh, it is ruination. It is space that we catch a glimpse of through the anarchitectural uh, cut. And what, what we might say here is that this is a space of nothing that artists who came here looking for something bumped up against and made their own. Um, Baltrop himself often looked way past these uh, conventional masculine bodies and instead looked beyond them, as you can see in this image, beyond the two figures to the peers themselves. The peers were his subject, far less the men who cruised uh, within them. And I'm super interested in this idea of the, the gay black photographer who goes to the peers. He, he often hung from a rafter, sometimes alongside Gordon Matt Clark, who was doing his own work in the piers at that time. And using his camera voyeuristically, he took pictures of gay men, but from such a distance that the human bodies are turned into mere specks. And no amount of sort of squinting uh, will tell you what exactly is going on between uh, these two men. Um, so it's like a Turner painting, if you like. The human figures have been reduced to tiny little dots that have been completely swallowed up by the visual and architectural drama around them. And that is uh, the, the real topic of Baltrop's work. He, instead of centering the human, he's interested in the architecture of the peers and the unraveling of the peers as they begin to uh, collapse. The humans are often uh, off center uh, um, or just part of the uh, furniture in the room, only recognizable as humans if you really um, pay attention. Um, he, they're often minuscule, suggesting um, a new frame for the human, one in which the human is completely dwarfed by this architecture that is itself, holds its, within itself a kind of eros. And I wonder what would happen if we paid attention to the eros of the architecture separate from the fantasy that we project onto it around these uh, bodies engaged in various uh, sexual acts. So finally, in relationship to this, and this is one of his most famous photographs, um, no humans, there, there may be humans in here somewhere, but we can't see them. And this one, he actually, he gave most of his works no title and no date. Uh, he probably never expected his works to be uh, published or viewed. He had very few shows in his lifetime and only sort of gained fame posthumously when Douglas Crimp um, paid attention to his work and wrote about it. But Crimp himself was mostly interested in the images of gay men cruising and missed the real drama of what Baltrop called the collapsed architecture. And this collapse, I think, is the topic of his uh, gaze. It's a collapse um, that is not simply you know, the, the, the sort of nostalgia uh, for ruins, but that suggests new geometries of bodies, materials, gravity, and entropic force that oppose the developmental narrative that adheres to the human. So by taking the human out altogether, we're left with this non-narrative of collapse. OK, so many of his images also, you'll notice, lean. And there's definitely a lean here. I'll return to the leaning uh, nature of the collapse uh, later on. But they le lean towards nothing, right? That's what it means to collapse in a way, is to lean in to s open space and, and fall into space. Um, and in that way, we're looking at the 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 falling rather than um, a site for presence and spatial formation. So when I was, you know, looking over Baltrop's work, um, I realized that what's drawing me to the 1970s and to these sites of ruination, it's very similar to what drew um, Jose, Jose Munoz in his book, Cruising Utopia. Um, he also was engaged in a kind of utopian earning, yearning for something that cannot appear except in the form of nothing. And this is what he says. He says, this performative insistence on the nothing, the not there, over the presentness of the happening, what is there, 
is both queer and utopian. And that's what I want to explore uh, with you a little bit, the utopian dream uh, of nothing. Um, Munoz uh, joined his interest uh, in the peers and in the sexual activity in the peers to a whole archive of avant-garde queer cultural production that you'll find discussed uh, in this book, including work by uh, a, a, an artist from the Black Mountain uh, College, Ray Johnson, who had his own take uh, on nothings. Um, and Johnson often held uh, nothings um, and they were sort of in opposition. They were anti-performative events, which were according to Munoz, minimalist, as Munoz puts it, in comparison to the overabundance that was associated at the same moment with happenings. So if Alan Capro was sort of choreograph the choreographer for these happenings that so preoccupied people in the 1960s, Johnson offers a kind of opposition to the happening by staging nothings. And these were sometimes performative events where he did not show up or where he did, but nothing really happened. Um, but he claims uh, himself, you know, this the inhabitation of this space of nothing as a uh, utopian. Munoz uh, himself wants to go with that reading of utopia, um, but in the end, he veers away from it and seeks the reparative route. So he writes, queer utopian practice is about building and doing in response to that status of nothing that has been assigned to us by the heteronormative world. So he's interested in nothing, but in the end, he wants to go back, Munoz, to building, saying what? Saying that queers have been assigned the value of nothing in the society in which they appear. Um, so what we have to do is sort of take on that nothing and make it something. And this is where I would part ways with Munoz and caution against the reparative gesture and ask whether we can stay with the nothingness, have the discipline to tarry with it in favor of digging into nothing and resting there in the minimalist non-space that it offers, offers the nothings rather than the happenings, the, the not showing up as opposed to the being together and then creating these uh, fantasies of community and so on. Now, just to finish this out on Munoz, Munoz himself in a chapter that sort of in a way departs from this arc that I've just outlined in Cruising Utopia where we take the status of nothing that's been to, assigned to us as queers and we make something out of it. Munoz in a, an amazing chapter on Fred Harco actually leans into nothing and finds a different kind of utopia. And in a jeté out of the window in Cruising Utopia, he writes about the staging uh, of Fred Harco's final performance um, as a, a suicidal leap out of a friend's apartment um, uh, in the West Village. And I won't go into it, but Munoz uh, frames this whole leap as part of a kind of surplus value within capitalism, a wasteful gesture, one that opposes a heroic leap that um, Eve Klein's doctored leap into the void. Uh, that, that was supposed to be like flying and inspirational and heroic and about risk and about transcendence and so on. Harko's leap, on the other hand, uh, was the perfect aesthetic gesture, uh, but one in which there was no safety net. He, he flew and he flew so far that he landed out the window on the other side uh, of the street. Harko's leap, which Munoz calls, uh, and this this is Harko again, and this is the building uh, out of which he jumped. Um, Munoz calls it incandescent, uh, not simply because it embrace, embraces death as part of its aesthetic, but because like the other cuts and frames favored by Matta Park and Baltrop, um, it finds a, a hole in the structure and makes new use of it. So the window here is not the place to gaze in contemplation upon the world. It is the, the space, a portal, if you like, through which to move in order to access a completely different uh, world altogether. So this world in which Ray Johnson staged nothings, Alvin Baltrop photographed collapse, um, and uh, a perverse dancer leaps perfectly out of an open window by the way, is a world that we can barely imagine anymore. And I'm sitting here in New York City looking across at buildings that are a testament to the complete rebuilding that has happened uh, in the 50 years since um, Matt Clark, for example, made his uh, 
gorgeous uh, cut um, in Day's End in the piers. Um, in the 1970s, buildings were collapsing rather than going up all night. Entire parts of the city were abandoned um, and no police went there. And in fact, one way to think about the piers is the alternative to the Stonewall Inn. This is the place of these quiet daily rebellions rather than the one spectacular rebellion that people uh, favor. It is a place where art by David Wanarovich and Keith Herring and others uh, was carried out uh, absent an art market upon within which it would be sold. Um, it was also the backdrop for some mind-blowing punk girl films that I'll try to get into towards the end of my talk, Times Square and Burning Burn in, born in flames. Um, the peers, in other words, were an object lesson in how to unbuild the world. Okay, so I just want to um, think more, a little bit more about collapse and this collapsing architecture uh, that Alvin Baltrop um, uh, created. And his work is, you know, it's often written about. Um, in the in the wake of Douglas Crimp's um, excellent essay on Beltrop, again, very much to just keep digging into the idea of these sexual subterranean worlds, much in the way that Delaney does in Times Square Red, Times Square Blue. Jonathan Weinberg's book, Peer Groups, also uses Beltrop's work in this way. And while most of the commentators do talk about these collapsing architectures, uh, they remain focused upon uh, gay male cruising as a real activity in the work. And in that way, they remain in this image and they ignore some of these kinds of images um, that to me are spaces of meticulous and beautiful processes of collapse. And you'll notice in this picture, this is again that, that incredible scale that Baltrop uses where you're, you, you cannot believe what you're seeing. There's that leaning that I talked about earlier. The whole building, very much like Gordon Matter Clark splitting, is leaning back on itself. Um, the, the whole architecture sort of tumbled in place and you can see other New York City buildings behind it. But in the foreground, just above the title of the piers, there are two men having sex, turned away from each other, almost as a, an illustration of Bassani's notion of self-shattering, of the self-shattering nature of sex between uh, two men where it's not at all about intimacy or looking into each other's eyes. It is about looking beyond the other and looking beyond the other to see this collapsing, sagging, leaning, falling uh, architecture. Um, the body in Baltrop's work is either minuscule or it does not appear at all. And here's another one of these incredible sags, leaning, uh, sagging, leaning structures that this one looks as if it's going um, right into uh, the Hudson. Um, but bodies, too, lean into the building. It's not just that the building houses men um, going, walking around looking uh, for, you know, hustling for business or looking for sex, but the building itself is of interest um, to the men in it. And a lot of the shots are candid shots of um, partially naked men engaged with the architecture um, itself. Sometimes they're actually severed at the waist, and there are quite a few of the images in which you don't know if you're looking at a body at rest or a dead body, um, bodies that appear as sort of discarded uh, waste. Um, and I think that these, and there's an, another one of these slanted images. It's like you're always sort of caught off kilter. You feel as if you're going to slip off the surface of the photograph. Uh, it's almost like a, um, this one is almost like a, a, um, a ship, as if you're on a, a ship and Baltrop had been in the Navy, and maybe that was what he was trying to capture, is the, uh, the sort of tilted quality of the ship in the relationship to the water. And it's a nice way of thinking about perversity as a kind of tilt, um, a tilt, a disorientation. Um, I think that one way that I like to think about this work, and this is why I push back on only reading this in relationship to the naked male bodies uh, engaged in sexual acts within it, is that Baltrop is in a way offering us an anti-patriarchal scene of detumescence. So I would just sort of, um, I mean, and here's, here's another one, absent uh, human 
activity or whatsoever, but with the writing on um, the door saying, watch out for pickpockets, which is such a hilarious um, uh, kind of graffiti in this tumbling, ruined, collapsing world of hustlers and um, drug dealers and so on. But I think about this work in opposition to uh, the phallic pneumatic inflatables um, of the last few decades, witness Jeff Koons' uh, ever erect uh, puppies that to me are uh, a, an analog um, to uh, the architectural investments the, in uh, real estate, um, real estate that in many ways is just for profit and has nothing to do with housing humans uh, whatsoever. So many of these photographs um, of the peers then engage us in thinking differently about um, uh, ha habitation, uh, about home, um, about danger, uh, the relationship between light and water, uh, the relationship between human bodies, non-human frames, and the purpose of the anarchitectural, um, the unmaking, unbuilding, collapsing um, world that he documents. Not a few of his works capture Gordon Matterclock's anarchist cut par excellence, Day's End. Um, and this cut is so great to think with uh, in relationship to Munoz's Disappearing Horizons in Cruising Utopia, but also in our moment to think about a conjuring of apocalypse or end times, that in, it's almost like a message from the past that arrives today um, telling us uh, in this moment that we have arrived somehow at day's end. Let me stop and think about Matt Clark for a moment with you. And um, I've written a lot about splitting and day's end, uh, and instead here, and on, me, on behalf of a collapse that should and could be about a real estate collapse, I want to focus instead on Matta Clark's um, project, Fake Estates. And this was um, a work that was, you know, one of his conceptual works that had almost no uh, visual beauty to it whatsoever, and that was aimed at revealing the fictional quality of real estate in the hopes of sort of unraveling the speculative um, uh, fiction that real estate unspools for us. Um, it was a critique of real estate privacy. It was an exposure of the ruse of improvement as just simply the beginning of gentrification. And it was a critique of the deep investment in ownership um, upon which capital and neoliberal personhood depended then and have reached a kind of apex uh, now. So what were fake estates? In 1975, Gordon Matt Clark purchased, just see how we're doing for time here. In 1975, Gordon Matt Clark purchased 13 parcels of land in Queens, New York, that had been deemed gutter space or curb property and put on the market for $25 each. Um, these properties were sort of cast as surplus land and they were parcels uh, of space that basically lay between residential and commercial property and was just owned by no one. And so the city decided to try to sell them. And Matta Clark um, wanted to uh, buy them, uh, it, but partly in order to underscore the absurdity of real estate, but partly to render them unusable, um, unoccupiable, and in that way begin to chip away at the real estate development that was surely already beginning and that would end, spell the end, the day's end of the piers, the end of Matta Clark's work there, the end of the cruising, uh, the end of this abandoned world um, that was beautiful, spectacular, dangerous, erotic. Um, the end of all of that, um, he you know, proposed sort of um, in this work, could happen by buying little pieces of land and piece by piece rendering the work, the, the, the land uh, unusable and um, uh, unlivable. So they stood, the, these little parcels, in opposition to work, production, and development, and stood instead for withdrawal from the market, playfulness, uh, and collapse. Playfulness, fake estates as opposed to uh, real estates. Um, Matta Clark 
uh, said, according to Pamela Lee, buying them was my own take on the strangeness of existing property demarcation lines. And of course, in those in those collapsing photographs of Baltrop, you can't see property lines. Property lines don't exist. That's part of the collapse is that the building that was tightly uh, contained within its property lines now tumbles over those lines and begins to spread across the landscape. Um, one thing I want, want to say in a sort of clumsy transition uh, here is that part of Matt Clark's project, I believe, was to empty space of use value and fill it with other kinds of meaning. I mean, that's part of what real estate does. It takes space, offers you know a, a use for that space in the form of a house, and then sells it uh, to consumers at you know grossly inflated uh, prices. Matt Clark, in, in, in contrast, was trying to withdraw things from the market remove the use value from them uh, altogether and then turn the speculation to other uses. You know, you turn the speculation into a kind of speculative imagination rather than this kind of speculation um, that we talk about in relation to real estate. Matt Clark, you know, in relationship to uh, Alvin Baltrop is often cast by people like Douglas Crimp as the good guy, uh, or Baltrop is the good guy to Matta Clark's bad guy. And Matta Clark is seen as a sort of homophobic trespasser in the world of the peers who came and put padlocks on the doors while he was working at Pier 52 and complained about the gay men who came there to engage in quote unquote SM uh, acts of, of uh, perversion and so on. But I think that this opposing of Matta Clark and Alvin Baltrop is just nonsensical. Um, and in fact, it makes so much more sense to me to read Baltrop and Matta Clark, who, as I said, often hung side by side uh, in harnesses from the roofs, uh, the, the, the girders of the piers to get their photographs or to do their uh, work hung there together. It makes more sense to think about them together as being interested in an aesthetic of collapse. Neither one of them um, had an audience in mind. There was no group for which their works were intended. They both shared, however, a utopian orientation to making space emptied uh, of meaning. And I think that they also both were drawn to uh, the dereliction of the space, to, to in, intensify the space's dereliction on behalf of removing uh, the peers or protecting the peers uh, from the market. So let me just say something about dereliction as promised. What, what is dereliction? What, what can dereliction of a space do that the rebuilding or reclaiming of it, of it may, may not do? And in order to answer this question, I want to turn to the work of a contemporary artist who I believe is working very much in this in the tradition of this kind of work by Gordon Matter Clark, the Fake Estates Project. And that's Cameron Rowland's uh, work on depreciation, which much of his work uh, is a comment on racial capital and is an attempt to drain value from all kinds of um, places, um, property, institutions, museums, and so on. And it would take a long time to explain uh, some of the work he's done at the ICI in London, ICA in London and um, uh, MOCA in LA. But just to give you one example, um, there's uh, a, a final look at Day's End and that um, phrase that Matt Clark uses repeatedly that nothing works and, and asking us to pay attention to nothing there. Um, and that's exactly what Cameron Rowland does. In a work called Depreciation from 2018, Rowland bought one acre of land on Adisto Island in South Carolina with the intention of withdrawing it from market dynamics. And this was a sort of um, commentary on post-slavery, the way in which former slaves had been offered um, 40 acres and a mule, and then this offer was in turn uh, reneged upon. And what... Uh, Roland's uh, work is trying to do is pull value out of property as a critique of racial capital. Uh, like Matt Clark's, Roland's work lacks visual excitement and is not, often nothing more than a, a document or set of documents like this. Um, and they often detail 
a claim made on a piece of land and the process by which that that land um, is drained of monetary value. And that's what happened with this piece on a distill island. Um, he kept putting liens on the land until it had absolutely zero value. Um, and it's these these gestures, draining value from a land, uh, making a cut into a, uh, a warehouse that's anyway going to be torn down, looking past the bodies of men copulating to see the collapsing architectures. These are um, the gestures captured in Johnson's uh, nothings. These are the gestures of the cuts of day's end. And these are the real sight of sort of anarchic, uh, unruly, unmaking, um, not the gay men cruising. And just to sort of, you know, impress that upon you, um, what we see today with the digital architectures of uh, Grindr is the sucking up of the algorithm for cruising and turning it into a, you know, handheld mechanism that allows cruising uh, for sex to become a capitalist wave of intimacy for profit. But I won't end with that. Instead, this I want to end this section uh, with David Hammond's homage to Gordon Matter Clark, um, uh, which is soon to be realized across from the Whitney Museum as a minimalist framing of air and sky, a repudiation of grinder and use value altogether in favor of emptiness. Okay. So I want to try to close then, um, and I don't have enough time to do this well, but just I'm going to just point out that I would be remiss if I simply talked to you about uh, gay men and gay male cruising and gay male photographers and straight male and architects. So I want to return to the peers and return to uh, the ruination of New York City in the 1970s and the early 80s via two feminist uh, projects, uh, Born in Flames on the one hand and Times Square on the other. And this is just to say that while all of this activity at the piers went on almost without any consideration of female bodies, and the, you know it was quite dangerous to go to the piers, and many people have said, uh, including female photographers who went there and took uh, images made made work that often they went with male partners um, because the peers were considered so uh, dangerous. But this film, Born in Flames by uh, Lizzie Borden, is a, a film about female solidarity in a post-revolutionary uh, world. It's an incredible uh, kind of piece of speculative imagination of the kind that we're opposing to speculative real estate in which um, the women... Uh, are part of a women's army that in the wake of a socialist revolution is still agitating for a whole set of queer and feminist demands. And as you can see from the images here, the women are willing to use violence to get their demands uh, met. And I encourage anyone who hasn't seen Born in Flames to go and look at, look, watch the film. I'm actually not going to play um, the clip because I don't have time. I'll play you another clip from another film that focuses specifically on the peers. Um, but I do want to say that the film emerged out of the exact same conditions that spurred on Gordon Matt Clark and that drew Alvin Baltrop's uh, camera. Fiscal restructuring, reorientation of the city uh, within a new neoliberal regime, um, a sense that um, everything was crumbling and now was the moment to kind of take advantage of it, um, but also a sense that in the abandonment of the city, in its ruins, it was women with children, uh, communities of color, and queers who were being uh, abandoned. And this film tried to think about coalitions of women who would band together and um, make their presence felt. The film ends just by the way, with the blowing up of a communication tower on top of the World Trade Center. And it's an incredible image that to me is just the, the perfect sort of spectacle for uh, what I'm calling unmaking the world. The film that I do um, want to just show you a clip of simply because it has a um, footage of the peers, is another film from uh, right around the same time that Born in Flames uh, appeared. It's called Times Square. And it was a more mainstream film, but it had an incredible punk soundtrack. Track, and it was about two young girls um, who, and it was made, by the way, by the production team that made um, Saturday Night Fever. 
uh, and it was about two young girls, 16 year olds, who uh, met in a mental ward in a hospital. Um, and the Ramones, I want to be sedated, escaped from um, the hospital together and went off into New York City uh, to defy parents and social workers and, uh, and so on and to get lost in the gritty, dirty city in search of something more than uh, what their parents or social workers had in mind for them. And one of the, interestingly, one of the girls is the daughter of the mayor's um, uh, development officer who's gentrifying the city. And she and Nikki the Butch, who you can see here, um, sort of fall in love and go to the piers to make uh, a home for themselves. It is in this clip that I think you realize a different kind of potential in the peers. And it's interesting how their, their utopian uh, erotic energy blends with the peers and is amplified literally by the peers. So I'm just gonna show you this scene. I mean, look. Like a bear top. <laughs> Bad boy. My bad. Now I see. Why didn't I realize it before? God, now I see it. Don't you realize this is it? This is the place. I'll show you, watch this. Hey, blood. Now give me yours. Come on, don't worry, I ain't gonna hurt you, just relax. See? That's all. Now, I want you to listen to me. You never feel like freaking... You get panicky, shaky. I want you to call my name. Just scream it. Scream it as loud as you can. You know, like this. Pay me! Pay me! Nikki! Louder. Okay, that's a beautiful scene that, uh, as you can see, that you know you almost expect to see uh, Matter Clark's Day's End coming into view, but it's it's literally love in the ruins. It's uh, 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 you know this blood oath that they make that just a few years later would be unimaginable and would constitute an unsafe uh, exchange. Um, in this space, represents the kind of. Uh, you know, the, the danger of their connection and then the, the way that their voices fill the space, voice, you know, a space that is com almost completely male occupied uh, at that point is a kind of different claim on the space, one that is not of ownership, but is more interested in sort of resonating, vibrating, echoing in the space. So in this film, you can say that the girls make identity out of brokenness. They salvage furniture, they dress in garbage bags, they push TVs out of windows to refuse the world uh, of he the hegemonic media. They reclaim the rhetoric of the insult, calling themselves the Sleaze Sisters, and they make common cause with the insulted, the marginalized, and the criminal. This is a history in the unmaking. It's a world that spins back on itself, echoes within uh, the collapsing architecture to tell history in multiple takes through the broken collapsing landscape of an architectural ruins. So I wanna end then by returning to nothing, by thinking about dispossession, and I'll do this really quickly, just in the hopes of you know offering one final 1970s text that brings together, I hope, nothingness, rebellion, collapse, dispossession, and emptiness. And this is a quote from Ursula Le Guin's now, I think, very, very relevant novel, The Dispossessed from 1973, 72, right around the same time as Day's End. Um, Le, Guin, um, Le Guin's main character says, in this book, those who build walls are their own prisoners. I'm going to fulfill my proper function in the social organism. I'm going to unbuild walls. And there it is, the anarchist soldering of unbuilding uh, to unmaking to utopian potential.
And this is uh, the book. For people who don't know, just very, very quick plot summary. Um, there are two planets in The Dispossessed, um, um, uh, Urus and Anaris. Uh, Urus is the sort of the, the main planet, the beautiful planet, the capitalist planet. And Anaris is the anarchist planet that um, is much uh, bleaker, but is the site of an anarchist experimentation uh, to which um, people who are dissatisfied with Urus have fled. Um, there are very big differences between the two societies concerning the treatment of women, the use of prisons, and a relationship, of course, to possession and dispossession. Shevik is a physicist, uh, an anarchist physicist, and he's being flown uh, to the capitalist planet in order to share his research with some scientists there. When he gets to the capitalist planet, he's seduced immediately. He can't believe that he has privacy. He owns his own intellectual property. He accesses drink. He has access to sex and uh, uh, parties and consumption and clothes. And he kind of becomes intoxicated with capitalism, if you like. But it quickly wears thin for him. And towards the end of the novel, a underground rebellion uh, is forming and the rebellion, um, the rebellious group gets in touch with him. And on behalf of their fight for freedom, they ask him to come and address the crowd as an anarchist from the planet of Anaris. So he comes to the protest and he offers this speech. We know that there is no help for us, but from one another that no hand will save us if we do not reach out our hand, and that the hand you reach out is as empty as mine is. You have nothing. You possess nothing. You own nothing. You are free. All you have is what you are and what you give. Okay, so in this speech, a speech that I wish a politician in our era would speak, a speech, however, that would not be out of place in the work of Cameron Rowland, um, the artist who is draining or leeching value out of land in order to point to the dynamics of possession that are in our inheritance from slavery. Um, these, this is a speech that you could imagine, um, you know, coming to us through the work of Gordon Matt Clark and Alvin Baltrop. It is a speech that lays out the principles of dispossession that involve only the only debt, and this is an echo now from Moten and Harney. The only debt we have is to each other, uh, a law that exists only in the principle of mutual aid, a way of being that involves sharing, not owning, an orientation towards dispossession that requires the destitution of everything that makes up capitalism. And I want to end with this image then um, of a collaborator of my, uh, with whom I work, Boy Child, um, who at last year's Venice Biennale, outside of the main areas of exhibition, Boy Child performed these dances in silence with no music, no accompaniment uh, that he or they call hand dances. And these are, for me, the kind of choreography that's laid out in that beautiful speech uh, by Shevik. Um, in a way, the hand dances channel the spirit of dispossession. Like Le Guin's anti-hero, Boy Child's gorgeous, sinuous, and anguished dance, it reaches and strains for a kind of empty handedness that must accompany all movements towards an unbuilt future. So we, let me end with this. We should all be recognizing now more than ever that nothing works and that it works to, to only if we move forward empty handed. We have to acknowledge that the hand that you reach out is as empty as mine is. You have nothing, you possess nothing, you own nothing. Only in that moment of empty handedness, when we have nothing, will we finally be free. Thank you.